Praise the Lord, everyone. How many is thankful to be in the house of the Lord once again? Amen. It felt good to get back to the, the normal Wednesday routine, come home from work and begin to think about um, service tonight and coming and gathering together. Amen. It was, uh, some people say we need, we're going to have a new norm, but some things I don't want a new norm. Uh, church just through the camera was great when we had to do it, but I don't want that to be the new normal. Amen. I want us to be able to gather together and glorify the name of the Lord. Amen. Um, if we would all stand, I know maybe we're getting back into the routine of things, but we are here and the ultimate goal is to feel the presence of the Almighty God. Because no matter what we do, no matter how we we set things up or, or what songs are sung or, or what whatever happens, if we don't feel the presence of the King, we're wasting our time. So tonight, as we gather together, no matter how few of us there are, how many of us there are, the ones that are watching, all of us in one mind and one accord, let's lift our hands and welcome Him into this place. The Bible says in His presence there's fullness of joy. Lord Jesus, we love You and we thank You tonight for the opportunity we have to be in Your presence, God. We bless your name tonight, Jesus, for there's no other name above your name, God. We worship you in spirit and in truth tonight, God. We need your will to be done, God. We need your purpose to be fulfilled in this place tonight, God. 
We welcome your presence into this place, Lord Jesus. We magnify your name above every name, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. We come into this place with an expectation, God, that something good is going to happen because we know in your presence, God, there's fullness of joy. In your presence, God, there's liberty and freedom, and we thank you for it, O oh God. We magnify your name, Jesus. We magnify your name, O oh God. I wonder if tonight, there's a scripture, it's probably my favorite. It says, it talks about in Colossians, it talks about how we are complete in Him. There's a lot of people in the world looking for something that will complete their life. They're looking for that thing that, that will, will somehow fulfill that thing that we all have that's yearning in our lives. But Jesus Christ is the only thing that can fill that void. We're not complete in the things the world has to offer. We're not complete in, in any other thing than in Jesus Christ. We are complete in Him. So tonight as we go into this service, into this time of worship, preparing us for the Word that's going to go forth, remember this one thing. If we can focus upon Jesus Christ, if we can keep our mind upon Him and what He wants to do, everything's going to be alright. And in Him we find fullness of joy and we are complete. Amen. We're here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords tonight. Join in with us. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King of Kings. We will worship the We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King of Kings. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King. And with our hands lifted high, we will worship and sing. And with our hands lifted high, we come before you rejoicing. With our hands lifted high to the sky, and the world wonders why. We'll just tell them we're loving our King. Oh, oh, we'll just tell them we're loving our King. We will worship, we will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King of Kings. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King, and with our hands lifted high, we will worship and sing. And with our hands lifted high, we come before you rejoicing. With our hands lifted high to the sky, and the world wonders why. We'll just tell them we're loving our King. Oh, we'll just tell them we're loving our King. And with our hands lifted high, we will worship and sing. And with our hands lifted high, we come before you rejoicing. With our hands lifted high to the sky, and the world wonders why. We'll just tell them we're loving our King. Oh, we'll just tell them we're loving our King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, you're great and greatly to be praised in this place, God. We bless your mighty name, Jesus. We bless your mighty name. 
This evening, as we go before the Lord with our prayer requests, is there anybody who want to make a prayer request known? Yeah. Just remember this. Remember this, Othio. Amen. Let's remember this. Yes, sister. Remember this. Yes, sister. Praise God. Let's just rejoice for that. We thank you, Jesus. We worship you, God. We magnify your name. Hallelujah. That's exciting. Yes, Sister Joy. Let's remember all of those in the church family. Let's just, we serve a healing God. We've heard a testimony. We've all probably have our own testimonies. We do serve a healer. So every time we come before him, let's come with faith believing. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight, God. We ask God that you would reach down into every situation, every circumstance, God. Every name that was brought before you today, God. We pray in Jesus' name that you would reach down and administer healing, God. Put your hand upon each and every one of these situations, Jesus. We place our faith and our trust in you, God. We thank you, Lord, for what you've already done. And we thank you, Lord, what you're going to continue to do, Jesus. We magnify you and we worship you. We give you thanks in advance, God, for the good reports, God. We give you thanks in advance, Jesus, for the healing virtue that is working on behalf of the prayers of your people, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. We magnify your name, Jesus. We worship you today, God. And we thank you for what you're going to do, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. This time we're going to have our ushers come. Take up our offering. If anybody was wondering, you still can give online. So if, if that's a more comfortable way for you to give or just makes it easier or easier to remember, whatever it might be, that is still available for anybody if you would like to do that. Ushers would come, take our offering tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Sharing a new song with you this evening called This Place. 
Lord, we want you, no one else will do in this place. Chains are broken, eyes are open, miracles are in this place. Hearts are
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord some praise for what he's going to do, for what he has done. Hallelujah. We've been praying for a long time for Sister Debbie. What an awesome report. Hallelujah. There is miracles in this place tonight. There is healing and deliverance in this place tonight. Whatever you need tonight, it is here in this place. What an awesome place we are just to be in the presence of the King this evening. Hallelujah. There's no place I'd rather be than in the presence of the King because in the presence of the King, there is miracles, there is wonders, there is deliverance, there is signs. Hallelujah. What a great place. What an awesome atmosphere is in this place. Praise God. Take that thing off. Praise the Lord. I'm so excited to be in the house of God tonight. I'm so excited that some of y'all are here. <laughs> in fact, a lot of y'all are here. I'm, that is awesome because I've only been having to look at a couple of folks. I'm, 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 I'm ready to see some new faces. <laughs> if I'm not having to look in the camera, I'm getting a crick in my neck because I'm always having to look over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> praise god i'm glad my wife is here on wednesday i've been missing her praise the lord you know uh it's just not the same because my my best critic my worst critic <laughs> the one that keeps me on the straight and narrow <laughs> sometimes i think it's the lord but it's really my wife that's why it says the bible says that when you find a wife you find a good thing because <laughs> she keeps us out of trouble us boys like to get in some trouble and she keeps us out. So I'm thankful for her tonight. She's here. That's This is the quietest I've ever seen Shelby in church. She, <laughs> she got a new toy, so she is enraptured back there. So thank God for Nana and Papa. <laughs> Amen. I'm excited to be in church. It's 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 been a, a crazy week already, just for three days. But I'm, I'm glad that we're in church tonight to get a refreshing, to get a renewing in the Holy Ghost to get through the rest of the week. But, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting time that we're in. Of course, we've been talking about it for a while, and it and yet the journey continues. And, you know, some people, they're always looking for answers to all their questions. Some people turn to a friend. Some people even have to turn to a doctor or a lawyer. And some even turn to a magic eight ball. I used to have a boss that had one of those things on his desk, and you'd ask him a question, he'd flip the thing over and look. And uh, it was always infuriating when it would say, try again later. <laughs> I'm telling you. But the problem is that there's so many answers that can come from all those sources. You know, you can go to, I always say that if you're in a meeting with three people, there's four different opinions. Because inevitably something that somebody says is going to change somebody's opinion. And so there's so many answers out there. But I'm thankful tonight that God only has three answers. Yes? No? And wait. Yes, we all love to hear yes. No, sometimes you can tolerate it, but most of the time. But the one that always gets everybody is wait. It is one of the most unnatural things that human beings do is have to wait. It is not our nature to have to wait. We want things and we want them now, especially in the age and day that we live you know, you put, you know, it used to be where if you wanted bread, you had to get out the flour and the yeast and the eggs and you had to mix it all up. And I know, you know, people staying at home, I, I hear there's a lot of people baking bread. Uh, but even then, now you just throw the ingredients in a bread maker and it pops out. But you had to wait for hours and hours. And now you just go to the store and buy it. Or, hey, you want some rolls, you just pop them in the microwave. And there they are a couple minutes later. And, you know, it's kind of a push button, get result day and age in which we live. But God is saying, you know what, there's still blessing, there's still awesome things that happen in a time of waiting, in a time of patience. You know, sometimes, you know, you go to the store and you buy that bread, and it can taste pretty good, but there's nothing quite like that homemade, hot, steaming bread right out of the oven. But it takes some time. Yeah, I'm going to start preaching about food. Those of y'all haven't had dinner yet, you're going to kick me out of this pulpit, I'll tell you what. <laughs> but... You know, that, there's something about that waiting. There's something about that smell coming up out of the oven that just fills the whole house, that just makes it so much better. But it's, it's that blessing in the waiting. And so tonight, I want to preach a message that has a weird title and a lot of punctuation. <laughs> and it says, what? Wait? That's my title. <laughs> I'm going to start in the book of James, chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. Very familiar passage of scripture. It says, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord 
for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, meaning he's full of pity. God's not a sad sack. He's full of pity, not pitiful. <laughs> and of tender mercy. You may be seated this, this evening. That's my scripture. The word patience is mentioned 34 times in the New Testament alone, and the concept of patience many more in both Testaments. It is the foundation of the church from the fruit of the Spirit to a requirement of salvation, according to Matthew 24, 13, that says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. And the scripture that we read in verse 11 references Job, and we all know Job and think of him as this great man of patience and blessing, especially at the end. He was the richest man in his era, in his, in his region, and in the end ended up with double. But I want you to see really how perfect this guy really was and, and, and what he was doing. And I'm going to start in the, in the book of Job, chapter 1, of course, in verse 1. It says, There was a land in the man of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, you could stop right there. I, I don't know that if anybody wrote an evaluation of me that the, one of the first things they would say is he is perfect. But look at this guy in the Bible, which cannot lie. One of the, the very first thing after his name is he was perfect. I mean, that, you could stop right there. But it goes on. It says, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters, so ten kids in total. His substance was also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a great household. So this man was the greatest of all men of the East. I mean, this guy was Bill Gates upon Bill Gates back in the day. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their sisters to eat and drink with them. In verse 5, and it was so when the days of their feasting was gone about that Job, Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now, this guy is so perfect that he is willing to make sacrifices for sins that his kids may or may not have even done. I remember growing up, my mom every once in a while would give me a swat on the backside, and I'd say, what's that for? And she goes, I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. She was just kind of rolling it ahead. Yeah, you too? Yeah, but you, <laughs> you know, she was just making sure that just in case she didn't see something, I, I was punished for it anyways. And that's the thing is, Job was so perfect that he even sacrificed for his own kids, not even for his own sake, but for his children's sake of what they may have done. This guy was really concern about the salvation of his children. He wanted to do everything right. And we know what happened. He lost everything in one day from his riches to his kids. And then the next, he loses his health down to the point that he had nothing left to lose. And even his own wife asked him just to curse God and die. The one thing that we don't know in all of this, and we look through all the chapters and his friends come and rail against him and, and this and that, and, and he talks with the Lord. But the one thing we don't know is how long he had to wait from the time he lost everything until the time he was blessed. You know, if you lost it all, and then by the end of the week you had double of what you lost, I think we could probably all still make it. If I knew, you know what, I only got like five or six days, I just got to wait this out, and it's all going to be good. You know, you can endure a whole lot when you know when the end is coming. But the problem is, is that even after Job was blessed, even after God gave him double of what he had, it didn't say that his kids miraculously came back to life and he had double the amount of kids. He still had to deal with the loss of his children. They didn't come back. He still had to endure the memories of his wife telling him to curse God and die. How could Job still be faithful to God even after all that hurt from all those people? Even his own friends turned on him, his own wife, his better half turned on him. It's because he realized that the relationship that he has with God is not based on the relationship that I have with you. It's the relationship that I have with God. Others may come against me and others may try to tear me down, but my relationship with God can still be strong. There are people that have done me wrong in the church, even pastors and presbyters, but that doesn't stop me from coming. Why? Because my faith is rooted and grounded in God and not in man. See, men fail. People get carnal from time to time, but God is the same yesterday, today, 
and forever. The Bible talks about when, when God was, uh, the revelation of who God was to Peter. And he said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church. Some people interpret that as being he was building the church on Peter. That's where the Catholic church gets their idea of he was the first pope. But I don't think God would be ignorant enough to build his church on a man. Because men are, are fallible. Men fail. Men come down. But it's that re revelation of who God is that Jesus was saying, I want to build my church on today. Hebrews 12 and 1 gives us some hope that says, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, you know, there's so many things, not only from the testimonies that I hear from my brothers and sisters, but the things that I've experienced in my own life to say God is good in all situations, that God loves me in all situations, that I can endure as long as I stick with the master. The Bible says, lay us, let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, the thing about running a race is, you know, unless you're one of those super competitive people that wants to be first, and, you know, if you're not first, you're last. If you get that reference, I'll pray for you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you're just trying to finish the race, if you're not worried about placement, if you're just trying to get there, you know, as long as you cross the finish line, it doesn't matter what your time is. There's some people that, man, they can just, you know, they do marathons and they just run the whole time, man. It's just like pedal to the metal the entire time and they finish like in two hours or whatever the time is. I'm, I'm not a runner. I know that's shocking to you. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but the thing about it is, you know, there's somebody that comes in last place and they may be you know, four, five, six hours. I don't know. I don't even know if they cut them off. They could have walked the entire time. But you know what? At the end of the day, they can say, I finished that race. I can say I did 26.2 miles. I got my medal. It doesn't matter whether you were first or last. You still finished. And that's the thing about heaven. It doesn't matter whether you are the lowest of the low or sitting next to Jesus. If you make it in, you're in. And that's more than a lot of people can say. Hallelujah. There are too many folks who have seen the greatness and the wonder of God in their lives. Let their witness influence you and not temporary emotion and lack of patience. God knows what you have need of. God knows the situation that you're in. He is not ignorant. He has been there. You know, me and my wife were talking the other day. That's one of the most wonderful things about this, uh, this quarantine going on is, first of all, I'm like home all the time. And we have like things like slow down and we have so much more time. And me and my wife, we've like sat down and like just talked about the Lord like for hours. Like we haven't done that in forever, not for lack of want or lack of trying, but it just seems like life gets in the way. But we were thinking about this the other day. Think about, you know, Shelby loves to read all of her Bible story books. That is her favorite thing. She's in love with baby Jesus because baby Jesus is a baby and all babies are amazing, that, according to Shelby. So why not baby Jesus? And the one thing that she loves to see is pictures of baby Jesus sleeping in his manger. And he knows, she knows that Jesus didn't have a bed, he had a manger. And the thing about it is, is think about the first time after the Lord was born in human flesh that he had to go to sleep as a child, as a baby. The Lord had never slept before. The Bible says he doesn't slumber or sleep. He didn't know what that was all about. He had to go to sleep for the first time. Think about that. Isn't that crazy? Like all the things that he would have had to experience as a human being that he would have never experienced if he wasn't in flesh. I mean, that's just obviously the spirit of God continues, but the fleshly nature of God had to go to sleep. I, and especially as a baby, babies sleep a long time. I mean, you know, lots, you know, what, 18 hours a day or something that he had to experience that for the very first time. And that's the thing is God, that's the reason he had to come down is because he wanted to see and experience, not just to sacrifice his life, but he wanted, he had to get the opportunity to see and experience what it was like as us, as human beings, the things that we go through, the frustrations and, and whatnot. Think about it. He was born as a little baby with the full knowledge that he was going to have to go to the cross 33 and a half years later. Would you, how, how frustrating would that be? You, you see people dying left and right that aren't being able to be saved. And you, you could like, hey, why don't we speed this up? Why don't I go to the cross when I'm 16? I could save so many more people. But he had to wait. It had to be in the fullness of time. Those scriptures had to be fulfilled. There was a plan and a purpose that God had set up in himself. And God knows what we have need of. And Luke 12 and 22 gives us such hope because God is right there and understands our needs. 
And it says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? Think about it. I've never seen a sparrow in a bread line. They always just seem to have enough to eat. I've never seen a squirrel, you know, go into schnooks. You know, God makes sure that they're provided for. Praise God. And which of you with thought can add to his stature one cubit? And ye, if not being able to do the thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? It's like, God's like, listen, you can't even change the littlest of things. Why are you worried about anything? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If you think about a beautiful field of flowers out there, you know, the greatest master painter couldn't even really paint the exact nature of all those flowers. You know, we, we, we try to dye our clothes and come up with these beautiful colors. And yet every night when the sunset comes, it, everything that we've ever created pales in comparison to what God does on a daily basis. So then if God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe ye, you, O ye of little faith? If God says, you know what, I'm going to grow up the grass just so it's going to die away. My beautiful daylily, Sister Carla, she mentions me all the time because I think she thinks I preach about my daylilies all the time, but I'm so proud of them. My daylilies, they're so tall right now, the flowers won't come for like another month or so. But they come up and then every fall they die and it looks like there's nothing and they're not going to come back. But then in the middle of winter, when the, when the snow is still on the ground, here come little green sprouts coming up. And think about it. Those plants come up and grow to be this big, huge thing, and then they die every year. So it's like, think about that. If God takes the time to build that up just knowing it's going to die, how much more does he take care of us, his greatest creation? He, he didn't speak us into existence like every other thing. He, he got down on the ground and molded us and formed us and breathed into us the breath of his own body so that we could live and have a soul. So if he cares for us that much, why are we so concerned about the day to day? Praise God. And seek ye not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. God's not ignorant. He knows we need to eat, we need to drink, we need to breathe, we need to have a roof over our head, we need to have clothes on our body. He understands all of those things. It says, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God says, listen, I own the cattle on a thousand hills, and I own the hills, I own the gold under the hills, I own the oil under the gold under the hills, under the cattle. I got all this. God wants to give you the kingdom, but he's saying, don't worry about it. Just wait on me. God, God clothes the flowers and every day the birds are fed and we are better than those. Maybe you say, yeah, but I put out bird food. We do. We have a little um, bird feeder. It looks like a pork swing, a big long pork swing. And we put bird food in and the squirrels get most of it anyways. But, um, <laughs> but think about it. You know, yeah, we just put more bird food out, you know. We can feed the squirrels. So we love seeing the squirrels anyways. Who cares? Um, but think about it. You know what? Maybe God's just using you to fulfill his purpose. The birds have to be fed. Maybe God's just using you for that purpose. Luke 6 and 38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over. And this is the key thing here. Shall men give unto your bosom? See, sometimes we're always looking for God, for manna to fall from heaven. But sometimes it's people that can bless you. Sometimes it's just going through the day to day and getting a paycheck every two weeks. Maybe that's how God is choosing to bless you. We don't always have to have manna and quail fall from heaven. Sometimes you just have to go through the daily grind. I've had people come up to me and say, well, what am I supposed to be doing in life? And I say, well, what are you doing in life? Well, I'm going to my job and I'm taking care of my family and I'm going to church and I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm reading my Bible. Yep, that's it. You're doing exactly what you should be doing. Yeah, but well, what about this and that? Keep stick to the plan. Keep doing what you're doing. And when you've done all, the Bible says just stand. If you if you know, that's the thing, is some people get so frustrated because they don't think that this or that is happening. Maybe God's just having a chance to work in the background. You know, me myself, uh, I was a I was in theater for a long time. Uh, both of my degrees are in theater, and I used to work backstage. I wasn't an actor. I'm not good. Like, this is the most time I spent on the stage right here. <laughs> I, I, was, I was always backstage. And, you know, it's amazing. You, you go and you see, like, a, a play or something on stage or even a movie. 
you know, whatever. Lord bless you. Um, you see those things, and you see maybe five, ten people on the stage. Well, if you see five or ten people on the stage, there's probably 50 to 75 people backstage making that all happen. Trust me. Like, if it's a really quiet scene, and, you know, maybe this, there's just a couple people on the stage or whatever, there's literally, like, 30 people in the wings that you can't see flying around making stuff happen so that when things change and scenery has to come out and lights have to change and this and that, that they're all ready to go. Maybe God, you see, you're just looking at what's going on in the stage. God's backstage trying to get this set up and that set up and this position and that just right. And think about it. You know, whenever I, I always, this is how I get my wife. I know exactly what to say to my wife to just, just really get her go sometimes. Whenever she starts complaining about, well, maybe God's doing this, or I don't understand what God's doing that. This is what I tell her. I say, what about your grand piano? And she goes, what do you mean, what about my grand piano? Now she knows exactly what I'm talking about, and she knows exactly what I'm about to say. My wife's grand piano, I don't know if you know this or not. Yeah, she's right there. She's in the sound booth. I don't know if you know this or not. My wife's grand piano was almost 200 years old. It was built in 1836 in Boston, and Somehow, I don't know how, we still want to research this out. This might have to be some way asking this out. Somehow it ended up in a little country church in a little bitty town that my mom lived like 10 years ago. And we happened to go to that. Well, no, it was longer than that because we've been married almost 13 years. So it had been 14 years ago. Ended up in this little country church in this little bitty town where my mom was living at the time. And there used to be, there was a little UPC church there. And me and my wife would go there whenever we were in town. And we happened to walk in the Thanksgiving before we were married. So this would have been Thanksgiving of 2016 or 2006. Ooh, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> Good catch. Uh, of 2006. And somehow that piano was sitting in the foyer of that church because some church member's uncle had died and he was the only living heir and got his estate. And he was apparently this really rich dentist. And he had this piano and they were selling it to raise some money for the church. And we ended up buying that piano. How it ended up there? How I have no idea where it's been for the last 200 years. I have no idea. But think about that. God had to position that. I believe it was a blessing from the Lord and certainly been a blessing to my, from my wife. But think about that. God had to position that thing over the course of 200 years to end up here and there and there and there and not get destroyed and not get eaten by termites or whatever else like that. Survived the Civil War, survived two world wars, survived all that kind of stuff, and somehow ended up now here in St. Louis. Isn't that amazing? That is, frankly, that's amazing the way that God can set everything up. He knows what you have need of, and men can give into your bosom. Sometimes the blessings come from an earthly source as God directs them. But no matter what, God's children are going to be taken care of. I'll never forget this one time, and this is this is one of my angel stories. I have a few of them, and uh, I need to write them down. But I'll never forget, this is how God really takes care of his people. This is how God can be there in a situation if you'll just hang out and not get ahead of God. I'll never forget one time I was, I was working at the church in Montgomery that we used to be in, and we had one of those old letter board signs where you had to put the letters up individually. A lot of churches still have them, except when they put the one in at the church, instead of being on the ground because we were right off the freeway, they put it like 16 feet off the ground. And so you had one of those little poles. Well, unfortunately, our little pole, the suction cup broke, and so you had to get up there with a 14-foot ladder and change out those letters. So me, being lazy... I got all the letters lined up in a tub, and instead of walking them out to the front of the property, I drove my little car out there. Well, it had rained for a couple of days before that, and I was sitting out there in the grass, and the first thing I did was, after I did it, my car was totally stuck, and I was spinning my wheels and all this other, and I told my father-in-law, who's the pastor, who was working there too, and he said, well, we'll get the church van and we'll pull it out. So we hooked the 15-passenger van to the thing. We drove it out there, and guess what? The 15-passenger van got stuck. Now we're two in. We're looking like a pitiful little parade stuck down in the mud here in the front of the church on Highway 85 with 200,000 cars passing us every day. Um, so we're sitting out there wondering what's going to go on. And a couple of their guys, there was a guy that cut our grass that came out there and he saw us stuck and stopped. And he was like, no, I'm not getting my car out there because we're all going to get stuck. And so uh, we're sitting around in a little circle in the front lawn wondering what we're going to do. And all of a sudden we hear this really loud engine like like coming down the road and we look down the road and there's highway 82 that runs right in front of it. it's kind of like it's it's like literally a two-lane road but they call it a highway <laughs> and it runs next to 85 and down this road comes this guy on a four-wheeler dressed i'll never forget he was dressed all in camo like a camo jumpsuit from head to toe I had these big old boots on his face he had like a mask on a, a, a hat on couldn't really see much of his face and he stops 
And we're like, he, he pulls in and he stops and we're like, hey, can you help us pull the thing out? And I'm thinking, this is the dumbest, like, like Calvin, the, the guy that was kind of aggressive, he was like, I'm, he asked him to help pull us out. And I'm thinking, this four-wheeler is not going to be able to pull a 15-passenger van out of the mud. This is, this is the stupidest thing. So we hook the chain up to it. That four-wheeler pulls that van right out. We, we hook it to my car, pulls my car right out. Now, mind you, we heard this guy coming from like a quarter mile away. He had the loudest four-wheel I've ever heard in my life. After we got done pulling those things out, we're like, yeah, this is great. We're all slapping five with each other, not even thinking about the guy. We're all slapping five with each other like we did anything. And we turned around, and he was gone, disappeared. Didn't even hear him leave. Now, will God send you help when you need help? The Bible says that sometimes we entertain angels unaware. That's my angel on an ATV story. Now, I know some people say, well, y'all just weren't paying. No, this guy was right there. And then two seconds later, he was gone, and we never heard him go. Never seen him since. He didn't never say anything. He never said anything to us. We never did hear him talk. And there was four of us there. It was a camo, yeah. We just couldn't see him in the bushes. He was just hiding. (laughs) But think about it. God will provide us the help that we need if we're simply patient enough to wait. We were stupid enough to get the van involved and all this and that. If we had just waited, God was coming on a a four-wheeler. Praise the Lord. The best part is that when God blesses you, that everyone's going to know about it. The Bible says that when you pray, don't pray standing in the synagogues. Pray in your closet that God would reward you openly. Everyone's going to know about it, but they'll never know of all the hours of prayer, fasting, meditation, and sacrifice you put in. You know, it's amazing to see how much the church grows, and, and it just seems like people are coming in and, and just really enjoying the worship and, and being all this and that. But you know what? We have no idea how much this man has sacrificed how much he's prayed, how many people he's called, all this other. We have no idea. We just see the success. We see all of this. It was like, wow, this church came from nothing overnight. But who knows the sacrifice that's been made? Who knows the prayer that's gone up as a result? You see, we only see the end of the journey. When you see somebody that's got it all together, they didn't start that way, believe me. There's things that they've lost. There's things that they've given up along the way. Maybe things weren't always rosy for them, but God is faithful to those of his household. Think about Joshua and Caleb. They were the only ones out of the 12 spies that came back with a good report. But yet they had to wander around for 40 years with all those other idiots until they died. I'm sorry. I love Jeff Arnold, so if you hear me throw something out there, (laughs) praise God. But think about that. He had to wait. They had to wait for 40 years for all those other guys to drop dead so that they could go into the promised land. Caleb had to go and take his mountain with giants on it. You know, it would have been a whole lot easier at 40 than 80. But they had to wander around and suffer with all those other people. It didn't mean, though, that he blamed God or anything else like that. He just stuck with the plan. God had a plan, and Caleb was patient enough to stick with it. Listen, sometimes it's not going to look good, but God simply asked for us to stick with his design and trust him enough to do that. Think about it. David was chased around, almost lost his life several times and all that other after he had already been anointed king. He had every right to turn around and say, you know what, Saul, I've had two times to kill you, buddy, and I could have done it both times. But David said, you know what, that's not God's plan. I got to be patient and I got to wait. The woman that was sick that had that issue of blood that just touched the hem of his garment and was healed, how many years did she have to suffer for that? But once he touched the hem, then all of a sudden that became a thing. She may have been the first, but she wasn't the last. And it got even to where in the New Testament, where the shadow of Peter walking by healed people. God was starting to do that thing when people were patient. Paul's ship was seemingly going to sink, and some men wanted to get off. They were starting to lower the boat down. But Paul told him in Acts 27, 31, And he said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. God's saying, you know what? I've got a plan. I've got it all figured out. I've been here since the beginning, and I'll be here after the ending. And I've got the master plan. I'll go, and if you would just stick with God's plan, it would guarantee your success. Our biggest problem is that our expectations start to outweigh our experiences and leads to lack of patience. It's so amazing to me 
how some people have an expectation of God and that drives them away from the very thing that they're trying to get because they won't stick with the plane. Look in Matthew chapter 11, starting verse 2. It says, now when John, talking about John the Baptist, had heard in prison the works of Christ, he heard what God was doing. He heard that the blinded eyes were being opened, that the deaf ears were being unstopped, that the dead were raised, that the, the poor were having the gospel preached unto them. He sent two of his disciples and said unto Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Can you imagine in your life? Here's Jesus. He's doing things that nobody else has done before. He's come on the scene and is doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. John, when he baptized him, saw the dove come down and light on his shoulder. He's heard of all the miracles and seen all the signs and wonders. And he's like, you know what? Are you really the guy? Are you kidding? Are we waiting for another? What was John expecting Jesus to do? <laughs> Honestly. And Jesus answered and said to them, go and show John again these things which you do see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the day are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. The Bible records that even after John had heard it, that he still sent the two men. What were his expectations that were not being met? What things are we waiting for that we think God has missed the mark on? What timelines are we holding God to that we think he doesn't understand? What do you really need that God has not supplied? Our lives are built on expectations. Expectations of ourselves. Expectations of what our life is going to be. Expectations of God. But life postponed is not life lost. Think about the situation we're in right now. There's a lot of stuff that's being put on hold, but that doesn't mean that the time is lost. We need to figure out a way to, to grow and to learn and to increase ourselves even in this time. Like I said, me and my wife have sat down and talked about the Lord more in the last couple of months than we have in the last couple of years. There's something that good that can be found, that can be learned and made better in any situation. Before the job I was in, I was in two years, I was two years in another job that I hated. I hated this job. Hated it. There was nothing good about it. The pay was lousy. The hours were worse. The people were horrible. I just, oh my word. But I couldn't get another job. God had me in that position. I realized, man, I kicked and fought. I probably put in 200 resumes a year. Could not get a job. Nowhere. Every door was closed. Couldn't find a way out. I felt like I felt like Joseph in the prison. And I, was, I ended up leaving that job. It was two weeks short or two years, so I almost made it. Maybe I should have stayed another two weeks. I don't know. Um, <laughs> just so I could, you know, just Joseph stayed two full years, it says. So I'm going to stay my two full years. But think about it. That, when I look back at it now in the job that I'm in, in my dream job, I, went, I, literally, I feel like Joseph. I went from the prison to the, to the palace. I realize now looking back at that, that if I hadn't had that job, I wouldn't know how to do the job I'm in right now. And you're like, wait a minute. Before then, you'd been doing audiovisual for 18 years. Yes. And the stuff that I do now, I didn't do then. And if I hadn't gone through the other job, I wouldn't have known how to do it. I got two years of experience basically for free. And so God positioned me there so then I could be ready for the current situation that I'm in now. Maybe that's the problem with some of us. Maybe God has us in a position where he's trying to teach us, where he's trying to learn. You know, we're trying to learn and trying to grow but if we keep bucking and we keep kicking and we keep fighting and not learning the lesson that we're in, God's like, I'm just going to have to keep you there until you do. Maybe God is trying to position us for something better if we would just be open to what he's trying to teach us. Maybe staying at home has led us to more family dinners, more conversations, and more allowing of life to slow down from its breakneck pace. Maybe this isn't the worst thing that ever happened to us. Maybe it was the best. There is a price to be paid for being patient, though. Sometimes God might ask you to do things that don't fit in with your schedule, your plans, or even societal expectations. But trust me when I say that the end will always be better than the beginning. Yesterday we celebrated, well, we're putting it off till Friday because yesterday and today or tomorrow are kind of crazy. But yesterday was Shelby's third birthday. Praise God. You know, if you had told me when I was 15 the timeline of how my life would go from 22 onwards, I would laugh you in the face. But it wasn't until after 10 years of marriage that Shelby was born. 
10, I never imagined that I would wait 10 years to have my first child. And we got married at 25. So we were 35 when she was born. Never in my wildest dreams. That's like past when you're supposed to be done. Not when you start. At least according to most normal timelines. But God said, you know what? I have something special for you. We, little did we know when we first got married that just a few years later, God was going to call Charlotte to St. Louis to teach at Urshan College, and then we would be separated for a year and a half, me and Montgomery and her here. If we had had a child, who would have taken her? Charlotte wasn't even living. Charlotte was running a bedroom from a friend of a friend of a friend, and I was by myself working 60 hours a week trying to ch- keep the church going while her dad was having heart attack after heart attack how it would have worked. But God had everything positioned so that when the timing was right, when we got here and I was here for a while and I finally had a stable job and I finally, we finally got a house that God would bless us with our first child. You know, some people say, what's the most amazing week of your life? And it was that week because the day, two days before Shelby was born, I got the job where I currently am. Two days later, Shelby was born. It was the most life-changing week of my life. Praise God. We wanted a new, we've wanted a new car for Charlotte for a while. The old Old PT Cruisers, Ooh, more like PT Bruiser. It's a little, it's a little worse for wear. <laughs> Still need to give it you about them tires. Car hadn't run in a month because, <laughs> anyways, my wife will kill me if she <laughs> came out of nowhere. That's right. It just, just curb jumped up and bit her. Um, but we looked and we looked and we looked. But every time we found one and we're just, we were sitting there at the desk ready to just sign the papers, and that would be it. Every time God checked us and said, nope. And it's like, well, this is the perfect car, and it's in perfect condition, and it has the mileage we want, and it's the price we can pay, and we can afford it. And God said, nope, 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 nope. Little did we know that just a couple months later, we're all going to be working from home and in the situation we're in. So not only, now, neither one of us has lost our jobs, and we're still doing great, but she doesn't even need a car now because she doesn't drive to work. I don't need a car now because I don't drive to work. So I have a car payment for a car that's going to sit in the garage for who only knows how long. God knew what was coming, and we were patient and didn't force our will. And so now God is blessing us so we can save money, so we can have an even better car. I know God's going to give us something better because we were patient. God sees so far ahead and knows how everything will work out if we just stick to the plan. Do we have enough faith tonight and enough patience to do that, or are we going to force our own will? Will we let God be God and lead us and guide us? Are we going to buck his authority every time he asks us to sacrifice and do something we don't understand? Be honest. What could God ask you to do that goes against the flesh without you asking why or needing to know the end result? Would you give something to the Lord without promise of anything in return? Is he not worthy of that sacrifice? He gave everything. He had nothing to give back because he gave it all. Could God ask us tonight to give something to him, not knowing if we would ever receive anything back? Listen, he's either Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. It's an all or nothing kind of deal. Don't allow your preconceived ideas of what life is going to be like to drive you to get ahead of God. Just look at Abraham. He, he was promised a son. He had waited and waited and waited and got impatient. Had Ishmael with Hagar and not his wife. I would have loved to hear that conversation. Actually, no, I wouldn't. It would probably be horrible. Finally had Isaac at almost 100 years old. As a result, These two camps are still fighting to this day, the Israelis and the Palestinians. That one little mistake changed the course of world history. If someone had just stuck with the promise, who knows what it would be. God said that he would make Abraham's seed be as the stars of heaven, and he couldn't back down from it. So that's why we're in the situation that we're in. You know, he could have just killed the people of Ishmael off, but he said, you're of the seed seed of Abraham. You got to grow. God couldn't back down and be a liar. So even if it was the way, even if it wasn't the way that God meant it to be, when the cart gets in front of the horse, the trailer in front of the truck, or the wagon in front of the bike, you've got problems. You know, I was telling my wife that the other day we saw some kids hooking a bike to a wagon, and my wife's like, oh my God, that's crazy. I'm like, we used to do that all the time. <laughs> Only one problem. The bike has brakes, the wagon doesn't. <laughs> so you'd end up in the back tire of the bike. You know, don't count out God even when. It doesn't seem like things are going the way that you wanted to. My wife would come. <clears throat> February 5th, 2007. One of my favorite days. If you don't know what that is, you're probably not a New England Patriots fan like I am. <laughs> February 5th, 2007, a day that will live in Super Bowl infamy. New England Patriots came back from 25 points down 
against the Atlanta Falcons to win their fifth title and compete the largest complete the largest comeback in Super Bowl history. Praise God. Atlanta had rolled out to a 28 to 3 lead. Their defense forcing key turnovers and their offense chugging along, leading on Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Devontae Freeman for big yardage. They were comfortably ahead with eight minutes and 36 seconds left in the third quarter. Ryan having thrown two touchdowns and Robert Alford recording an 82 yard pick six after intercepting quarterback Tom Brady. The Patriots went on to score 25 points and tie the game up with just a minute left, completing the largest Super Bowl comeback history. The Falcons could not score, and with no timeouts remaining in a tough field position, the game headed to overtime, the first extra period in Super Bowl history. You know, maybe sometimes we're in overtime. Maybe sometimes we don't know where the end's going to be. But New England won the coin toss in possession. The Patriots went on to execute a flawless drive that culminated in a short rushing touchdown by James White, his third of the game, after a pass interference call gave New England first and goal. And they completed the largest comeback in Super Bowl history. Everybody at 28-3, to I know people that were watching that game, that when it got to that score, they turned it off. Because they said, it, it's over. There's no way. But through that crazy situation, they ended up coming back from what seemed to be an insurmountable lead and came back to win one of the probably the greatest Super Bowl victory of all time. So let us be patient tonight. They could have easily panicked. They could have easily thrown in the towel and said, you know what, boys? It just wasn't our night. But they stuck with the plan. They stuck with the game plan. They didn't make any changes. They kept doing what they know how to do, and it ended up in victory. That's what the patience that God is asking us to have tonight. Things may seem like they're not in a good spot. Things may, you, you know, I don't know everybody's personal situation, but I know that God has you right where he wants you right now. And that if we just stick with the plane, if you just keep doing the things that you know to do, that God is going to work that out. So let us be patient tonight. God has not forgotten you. He has you right in the palm of his hand. He loves to say yes to his children. Sometimes has to say no. But when he says, wait, believe me, that there is always a plan to move from that wait to one of those other answers. God bless you tonight. I hope you hope I made you think a little bit differently about patience tonight and let you know that God still loves you, God's still with you, and he knows where you are. Go ahead and say. Make me in your image. Wash me white as stone. You have got his heart of mine. Lord, I'm giving you control. Let me be a Hallelujah. I believe one of the greatest blessings, the greatest promises I could ever learn as a child of God is that delays are not always denials. 
that just because he's not doing something doesn't mean that he's not working. There's so many times. You know, I talk about the children of Israel a lot. They were standing there, all they could see around them was chaos, panic, fear. They didn't, they lost control of their situations. And we're going to do that. We're humans. But what they didn't see was the hand of Almighty God cutting a pathway in the bottom of that sea. And then he told them, take what I've given you and do what I want to do for you. And sometimes he, you're not going to understand it. I have to tell myself sometimes the only thing I can do is take what I have because I ain't always going to have what I want, but I got to go do it anyway. Hallelujah. Like the day I, I, I had the dream, I heard the voice, I, I saw it all. And you've heard me make reference to it over and over. I walked in that building and all that was there was 80 chairs, a soundboard, a set of drums, and a sound system, and me and my wife. But I had a dream. But long before I got there, God has showed me over and over, over and over. And there's many times that I would preach and there would be six of us there or eight of us there or ten of us there. And Sister Hewlin would walk by and said, Pastor, let me just tell you something. I know they're not here yet, but you keep preaching like that and they're going to show up. I said, I know. I've seen them all here that just didn't have a face on them yet. And if you've ever had a dream, okay, don't let nobody take your dream, but just because it don't move fast enough. You wouldn't be where you are today, know what you know today, if you hadn't trusted in Almighty God. Sometimes all you can do is take what you have and go do what God has called you to do. And that's in life in general. Right now, some of us are facing the uncertainty. You know, there's a, there's a balancing challenge in our world today. We don't know. Some scared to go outside, afraid they're going to get sick. But if we don't go get the... The, earth, the world going again and the economy going again, we're all going to be in trouble anyway. So what do we do? And all the problem is, and this whole thing in a nutshell, science hasn't caught up with the problem yet because nobody knows about it. But how many times have you faced something in your life that you wasn't certain about, that you really wasn't sure about, but you kept walking and you kept trusting and you kept believing. Sister Debbie, come to us. I've got cancer and she had to go. But tonight we heard the testimony. I don't know why I have to go this way. But God, if you need me to go that way, let me be willing to go that way because God needs somebody to see you be an endurer, not just to look pretty at church. He needs you to be strong. He needs you to be his child that he has called, that he has saved. How many is glad he saved you? Hallelujah. If we could fix ourselves, we'd have never came, but we can't fix ourselves, and we never will be able to fix ourselves. The only thing we get to do to help ourselves is yield ourselves to Almighty God and let Him do His work. Let me be a vessel, not just any vessel, one that's worthy to be used. I've told people, I leaned over, I said, don't forget God called us. No one else did. He needs you. That's why he called you. He saved you. That's why he saved you. He needs the church to just keep being the church. And one of these days when we look up, we're going to say, how in the world did we get here? But I was glad that I paid attention, that I was willing to make that sacrifice. And some of you are going through some tough times. And God's going to take care of us. That's all I can tell you. How do I know? Because he's done it over and over again. If we had enough time, I could hand this microphone to those two people right there. And they would be able to tell you stories that you don't even know you would be able to endure. But they're here. They've been serving God for over 60 years. All I can tell you, anybody that's been serving God for 60 years, that proves to me this thing is real. Hallelujah. It is real. And it does work. And it is faithful. And God is always there. He's that very present help. They'll tell you over and over and over again. That's why God has elders in your life. 
why God has older people. I mean, that ain't me, but somebody like Brother Singleton or something. You know, just, oh, I didn't say it. <laughs> She's looking right at me. I was going, hey. <laughs> She's looking right at me with that beans. You know, you know what the Bible says about that beans, does you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, God is good. But most of all, God is faithful. So let's continue to pray. Hey, happy birthday, Shelby! Woo! She brought me a birthday gift. And I got this big cup that I can drink coffee, soup, egg drop soup from a Chinese place. Huh? You like egg drop soup? Trust me, it'll hold a bunch. You get the whole order, hold half of it in one drink, you know. But and then my favorite Kit Kats, you know, which mysteriously I didn't get to see. That's what I was missing. Thank you, Tammy, for the cake. Sister Tammy came, sort of heard you didn't get a cake. Where's Stephanie? She got me a card. What cake? Okay, I get it. I love you, Tammy. Keep on doing your thing. Right. Chocolate cake with white cream cheese. Make you get the Holy Ghost three times to see one piece. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's, that's hard. Right. Amen. But let's stand to our feet. Thank you for coming. Amen. Thank you for those that tuned in. Amen. Don't forget, pray for Sister Aunt Marge. That's what I know her as. Sister Aunt Marge, Steve's aunt, that God would help her and her family right now. They are in the midst of a crisis. God's going to help them. Amen. Lord, we love you and thank you for your blessings. Oh, we're so thankful for every promise, every miracle, every blessing that you have done. And if you never blessed us again, we still would owe you praise till the day, hallelujah, that you call us home. But God, you're so faithful. Ned, you're, you're always mindful and you're always understanding and you always care. Hallelujah. And you always help even when we can't help ourselves. You always love when we can't even love ourselves. You always lead us and guide us when we can't even help ourselves. Thank you for all that, God. Thank you for everything you've done. Go with us, but not from us. Bring us back again Sunday with praise and worship. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Clap your hands and get, give God a praise as we are dismissed. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Hallelujah. God, we love you.